Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We are in chapter 11 this morning, but we're going to finish that chapter and look at the first 12 verses of chapter 12. So I'm not sure this was the best chapter division that the editors gave. I think that the first 12 verses go with the previous verses, so that's how we will treat it. We're going to begin with uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 27, and you'll remember this is the last week of the Lord's life. He's entered Jerusalem in what was called the triumphal entry. He has cleansed the temple, and now we read verse 27, they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And began saying to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, and you answer me, and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. They began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe him? But shall we say from men? They were afraid of the people, for everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And and he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again he sent them another slave, and they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and that one they killed. And so with many others, beating some and killing others, he had one more to send, a beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to seize him, and yet they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. On Tuesday of the last week of Jesus' life, he was walking in the temple when a group of men approached him and asked, by what authority are you doing these things? It's a good question, one we should ask ourselves because we are all under authority. Even our government is under authority. It's the Constitution of the United States, the supreme law of the land. When it violates the Constitution, when one branch of government oversteps its bounds and usurps the function of another branch of the government, that is unconstitutional, illegal, and so illegitimate. It's the same here. So when these men came to Jesus with the question, by what authority are you doing these things? 
They were challenging the legality of his deeds. He had come to the temple the day before and thrown out the merchants and money changers. He cleansed the temple and restored it to a place of worship. He had closed the bazaars of the sons of Annas, upset their monopoly, and challenged their control of the temple. Who gave this carpenter the authority and the right to do that? That's what they were asking. And the men who were asking the question were powerful men. Mark describes them in verse 27 as the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. These were the religious rulers, the aristocrats and lawyers, judges and city fathers. They were the Jewish power. They were the authority. So they thought. And he had reviled them. So they asked their question, which on the face of it was a good question. But in fact, was a ruse an attempt to ensnare him in an incriminating answer. They were already anxious before he arrived in Jerusalem on Sunday, but after he accused them of uh, turning the temple into a robber's den and closed it, they began plotting to destroy him. Jesus knew that. He knew what they were up to with their question. So rather than answer them plainly, he asked them a question. If they would answer him, he would answer them. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. Now this wasn't a way of avoiding their question because as he said, if they answered him, he would answer them. At the same time, his question put them on the horns of a dilemma. Because whichever answer they gave, it worked against them. They saw that. They began to talk things over. If they said his ministry was from heaven, then they were morally bound to believe John and follow Jesus because John had pointed to him as the Messiah. But if they said his ministry was from men, well, then they would infuriate the multitudes who followed John and believed that he was a real prophet. And they were afraid of that. The, the Lord had masterfully turned the tables on them and they knew it. So rather than answer, they pleaded ignorance. We don't know. They knew. Calvin was right. They knew the truth, but they preferred to shuffle rather than to acknowledge it like uh, card players who shuffle a deck in order to confuse or hide things. Uh, they did that. They shuffled so that their tyranny, as he put it, wouldn't be impaired. They, they took a, a back seat. They let truth, I should say, take a back seat to self-interest. And there's nothing unusual in that. These, uh, these priests and elders are really just a mirror on human nature. And it's John chapter 3 and verse 19. Men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And I'm afraid none of us can escape that charge, not completely. Even Christians harbor darkness and resist the truth when it is inconvenient and it challenges us. When the Israelites came off the desert and conquered Canaan, and this was the faithful generation, the unfaithful generation. Their parents had, had been killed off in the wilderness. And now this was the faithful generation. They enter the land believing firmly that the Lord has given that, that to them and they conquered the enemies. And then at the end of it all, when Joshua gives his last sermon before he dies, he tells them to put away their foreign gods and incline their hearts to God. Even the faithful generation was carrying idols. John ended the first epistle that he wrote, 1 John, with the admonition, little children, guard yourselves from idols. He's writing to Christians there. That's the human heart. 
John Calvin put it well when he said that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. We manufacture idols. And that's true of Christians. We are justified. We are declared righteous and forgiven. But we're not perfect. We are what the reformers call righteous sinners. Simultaneously righteous and sinful. Justified but not yet perfect. Sanctification which is the Christian life, is about changing that. It's about delivering us of our sin and instilling righteousness in our minds and our deeds. It's about cleansing the temple of our heart. That is a sovereign work of God. It's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. He sanctifies. But He uses the Bible to do it. It is our authority. It is the constitution of the heavenly land of which we are citizens. It governs us. It guides us. It it shapes our thoughts and our deeds. It is the light that the Holy Spirit shines into the corners of our hearts and exposes things that are hidden there. Now, we don't like that. But we only grow when we respond in faith to the light of God and cast off the idols, the sins that entangle us by submitting to the truth, by putting ourselves under God's light, under His truth, and obeying it. Unfortunately, God never abandons us to our willfulness and our resistance. He never stops dealing with us and correcting us and bringing us to the truth. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, the conflict between the, the flesh and the spirit. They're in constant conflict so that you cannot do what you want. You cannot do the things you desire to do, whether good or bad. There's that constant conflict because the Spirit of God is working within each of us. But these men who challenged Jesus, who who knew the truth and chose to to shuffle, to obfuscate, to hide in order to carry on their tyranny, the Lord would give them no light. Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. There is a terrible law that runs throughout the Bible. And that is where light is rejected more light will be withheld. If you resist the truth, you won't progress in the truth. In fact, you will regress. These men weren't seeking truth. So the Lord denied them truth. He instead left them in suspense. But He didn't leave the matter there. He gave a parable about a vineyard in which He indicated His identity and also the authority by which he did these things. And at the same time, he warns the people who were there listening to him against those leaders and against what they were doing. It's a parable about Israel's failure. The meaning of it was obvious to all who listened because Isaiah told a very similar parable in Isaiah chapter 5. In fact, he begins quoting that, that story. It, in it, the vineyard symbolized Israel and the owner of the vineyard is, symbolized God. The owner planted a vineyard, provided everything to make that vineyard profitable, but it produced only worthless grapes and was destroyed. It was a familiar passage to the Jews. In fact, uh, it was one of the passages that they sang in the synagogue. So they're all very familiar with the image that Jesus chooses here. And so using that imagery, that familiar imagery, the Lord told of a landowner who planted a vineyard and rented it out to some vine growers. They were sharecroppers. They were tenant farmers who would cultivate the vineyard and in return for a share of the produce, uh, they would do that and then the rest of the produce would go to the owner. Then having hired the tenants, he left and went on a journey. He was gone a long time, long enough for the vines to grow and become productive, long enough also for the tenants to resent the owner and come to feel that this 
vineyard was really theirs. And so at harvest time, when the owner sent one of the slaves to collect the produce that was due to him, the tenants refused to honor their agreement. Verse three, verse three says, they took the slave and beat him and sent him away empty handed. The owner sent another slave. Man, he was treated the same way. They wounded him in the head, treated him shamefully. And he sent another. And that one they killed. And so with many others, beating some and killing others. What is amazing about this is what I think we all recognize as being amazing, and that is the patience of the owner. We would have expected him long before to have taken action against these wicked tenants. He had the law on his side. But this owner was unusual. In fact, this owner is unique. He sent servant after servant. And now, still patient, he decides to send one more person. This one, a very special person. Verse 6 calls him his beloved son. That can be translated his only beloved son. He sent him saying, they will respect my son. But they didn't. When they saw him coming, they began to scheme among themselves. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. You wonder, how could that be? Well, according to Jewish law, if an heir did not claim a piece of land, it was considered ownerless and after three years could go to those who worked it. So that was what they were thinking and that was their plan. And so they carried out their plot. Verse 8, they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Now what? The owner had been patient to a fault, it would seem. But now this, his only son, his beloved son, brutally murdered. What will he do? That's the question the Lord put to those listening. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Will he ignore this violence? Will his patience continue? No, he won't ignore this. This time he will personally visit the vineyard and visit it with justice. He will come, the Lord said, and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Now parables are stories with meanings. And the meaning of this parable was clear to all who listened. They knew Isaiah chapter 5. The owner is God. <clears throat> The vineyard is Israel. The vine growers are Israel's leaders. The slaves are the prophets, often referred to as servants in the Old Testament. And the son is the one who is speaking, the one who is telling the parable. He is Jesus. Now there's always a danger when interpreting a parable of, of pressing the details too far um, beyond their intended me meaning and seeing more in the details than is meant to be there. For example, the owner's hope that the tenants would respect his son shouldn't be taken as reflecting an expectation by God when he sent his son into the world that men would, would respect him, that men would listen to him and follow him. Acts 2.23 states very clearly that Christ was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. The crucifixion wasn't a mistake of history. It was planned. He knew how the world would receive Christ when He sent Him. This was ordained, He says. The point of the parable is God dealt graciously and patiently with His people throughout history, century after century. He dealt patiently with them, but they willfully rebelled against Him. He sent His prophets, His servants, to warn the nation, but the nation rejected their message and abused them. They killed some. They harmed others. You see this, for example, in Isaiah. Tradition has it, He was sawn asunder with a wooden saw. 
Jeremiah was abused repeatedly, put in jail, put in a well, taken off to Egypt. They abused the prophets. But God was patient with the nation and finally sent His Son, His beloved Son, who is more than a prophet, just as the landowner's son was, more than the, was greater than the slaves, Christ is infinitely greater than the prophets. They came asking Him, by what authority do you do these things? And He tells them here, by the authority of the owner. He was sent by Him. He is His beloved Son. In fact, when He cleansed the temple, you remember, He talked about the temple being my Father's house. The owner is their creator who called, redeemed, and established the nation. He is the one who sustains them every moment. He is God Almighty in whom we live and exist. And they were provoking Him. In 1741, revival was spreading across New England but not in the town of Enfield, Connecticut. So the pastor of the church invited Jonathan Edwards to come preach. The sermon he preached is the most famous in American history. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. His text was Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Their foot shall slip in due time. In it, he warned the unconverted of how uncertain life is at every moment. It's like walking over hell on a rotten floor. At any moment, it can give way. Natural men, he said, are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. Oh, sinner, he said, consider the fearful danger you are in. The most famous sermon of American history is also the most infamous. People don't like hearing about hell. They don't like such dire warnings. They don't want to, they don't want to hear that. And yet, that was really the Lord's parable. He, he knew what would happen in Jerusalem. Just as the, the tenants killed the owner's son and threw him outside the vineyard, these priests and scribes and elders would kill him, would kill our Lord outside the city. Nothing surprised him. He didn't expect them to respect him. He had come for this very purpose. He reveals that here in the, in the parable that he tells. He was exposing their, heart, their hearts and their plot, a plot that would make him the sacrifice that he came to be. But still, what they would do was evil. And if the owner of the vineyard would come for those tenants and destroy them, the owner of Israel's vineyard, the Lord God would come for these men. To quote Edwards, the only thing that preserved them was the mere will and forbearance, patience of God, and he's angry. And they were provoking him. So judgment came on the nation. Historically, that was in A.D. 70 when the Roman legion sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and scattered the Jews across the face of the earth. And as the Lord prophesied in the parable, the vineyard would be taken from them and given to others. The Lord has done that. The book of Acts records it. The church began on the day of Pentecost with a, a revival among the Jews. Many were saved that first day, and you read those first two chapters, and uh, multitudes are being saved. And it continues on in the early chapters of the book and in the early years of the church, it was originally a Jewish church. 
But in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, Luke records the conversion of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, a Gentile, and a shift begins. In Acts 13, the synagogue rejects the gospel, and Paul says, we are turning to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles rejoiced. Paul illustrated what happened in Romans chapter 11 with the olive tree and how God has broken off the natural branches and he's grafted in the wild branches. Gentiles have been placed in Israel's blessings. Israel, because of their sin, their unbelief has been broken off. And Paul makes it clear that that's not the end. There is a, a future for the nation Israel that the natural branches will be grafted back in. There is a future for the Jews and it will be glorious. They will come to faith and they will be brought back into these blessings and it will be a glorious time when the kingdom comes and we look forward to that. Their loss is, is partial and temporary, but in this age in which we're living, the Gentiles are the majority in the family of God. This has taken place, what he predicted. The, these men, the priests and the scribes and the elders, schemed against the Lord to, to keep their position, to keep their possessions, to maintain the status quo. And the irony of all of that is that the result was they lost everything by doing that. They lost everything temporally and most... Seriously, they lost everything eternally. Now that's the warning in all of this. But the Lord wasn't finished. In verse 10, he moves from parable to prophecy and quotes Psalm 118, where a similar action of rejection is described. This is the same psalm that the people sang two days earlier when Jesus entered Jerusalem, sang it joyfully. But as they shouted, Hosanna, he was thinking of the words cited here in verse 10 when he asks, have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. The psalm pictures the construction of a building and the builders taking stones and placing them in their place and coming to this one stone that they think is defective and they reject it. But that stone was later found and used as the cornerstone. Maybe on a wall around the roof or maybe we'd understand that as the capstone. This picture given in the psalm may have been written about David, who is a type or an illustration of Christ. Just as the builders rejected the stone, David was rejected by the nation and everyone. He was rejected by his own family when Samuel came to anoint a new king. You remember, he comes there and there are these sons of Jesse and they're strapping young men, handsome young men, and he knows, well, the king's one of these. And he begins to examine them and none of them is the one that he's to anoint. He, the Spirit of God tells him, it's not here. What, what's happened? Uh, do you have another son? Oh, yes, yeah. so the youngest one, he's out in the field shepherding the sheep as though he doesn't count. That's the one that Samuel anointed, but initially he's rejected by his family. He was rejected by Goliath when he came out into the Valley of Elah to do battle with that man, and he... He rejects him and mocks him on, uh, on the site. And then after that great victory, and after other victories, Saul, the king, rejected him and hunted him down like a common criminal. Even in his kingship, he's rejected by his son Absalom and most of the nation. But it was David who had been despised and rejected who was elevated to be Israel's greatest king just like a rejected stone that later is put in a high and exalted place, an important place. But the stone is not only a picture of David, of course. David himself is only a picture, a type 
of His greater Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate fulfillment of the psalm. He would be rejected by the nation's rulers, the builders, but God would make Him the chief cornerstone. He would elevate His Son to be King over Israel, King of kings over the world. This was not random or accidental. It was planned. That's what the psalm indicates. This came about from the Lord, the psalmist wrote. This is purposed. And, he says, it is marvelous in our eyes. Marvelous because it came about through the resurrection when Christ defeated death itself and was glorified. All of that as historical proof that God the Father accepted His Son's sacrifice for us. He raised Him as proof that He had accepted the atonement that He had made. And through it, through that death, that sacrificial death, Christ obtained our forgiveness. He obtained eternal life for everyone who believes in Him. He had saved His people by His death. And He will right all wrongs and bring justice and righteousness to this earth someday based upon that righteous work that He did and the fact that He is a living Savior. He'll come again and establish His kingdom on the earth. Now only God can do that. He turned something tragic into something marvelous. He vindicated His Son, and in vindicating Him, He's vindicated everyone who is in His Son. He's vindicated every believer and has demonstrated and assured us of ultimate victory. So that's what we look forward to. He does make the wrath of man to praise Him, as the psalmist said. When the easygoing congregation of Enfield, Connecticut heard Jonathan Edwards' warning that they might be sinners in the hands of an angry God, they responded. Even before the sermon was done, even before he got to the conclusion, in fact, the story is he never was able to finish the sermon because they were moaning and crying out all over the church, what shall I do to be saved? It was a great awakening. That's not what happened in Jerusalem with these priests and scribes listening to Jesus. They understood Him. They knew that He was speaking of them, that He was telling them of their guilt, and He was warning them of judgment to come. But it didn't soften their hearts. It only hardened them and their resolve to kill Him and they would have done that right then and there. They were seeking to seize him, Mark says, but they feared the people. So instead, they left him and went away. A few days later, they would return under cover of darkness, seize him, and crucify him. They wanted to know by what authority he did what he did, and he told them. He was sent by his father, the owner of the vineyard, their God and creator. And they rejected that. They rejected God and his word. They were their own authorities. They were a law unto themselves. That is the natural man. And the result would be disastrous for them. We think we know what's best. We think we know reality, who we are, our place in the world, the nature of the universe. We think we know these things. Uh, the, the world around us it confirms that. But it's Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That is always the end for those who find their authority for what they do, for their thinking, for their reason, for acting. Find it in something other than the Word of God. It may seem right, and from the testimony of the world and the confidence of those around us, the scientists, the philosophers, whatever, it seems right, but it's wrong. 
What those who trust in the Lord discover is what he says, what he reveals in his word, in the scriptures, is marvelous, as the psalmist said. Just think uh, of what is revealed here about God the Father and his Son. First, that, that God is patient towards sinners. Who would keep sending servants to wicked tenants as the owner of this vineyard did? You wouldn't. No man would. But God did. All through Israel's history, century after century, He gave them truth and He gave them opportunities. He's done the same with you and me. He has been patient with us in order to bring us to faith and a saving knowledge of Him and His Son He has shown each of us patience, persevering love. He does right now. He does that with you every day. In fact, the ultimate act of love is illustrated in the landowner sending of his beloved son. He, He sent prophet after prophet, but none like his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the son came willingly. Not in an attempt to reason with men. He didn't come naively thinking that he could convince them of anything. He came to give himself as a sacrifice for them because only in that way could our sins be atoned, paid up in full, and our guilt removed. We're reminded of that from everything our Lord says. And that's good news. There's no greater news than that. Peter told the Sanhedrin, and when he spoke to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, he must have been talking to some of the same men there that had talked to Jesus here in the temple. Not all that much before, after that. So he speaks to them and he says, There is salvation in no one else For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There's only one Savior. That's Jesus Christ. Only one sacrifice. That's sufficient. His sacrifice. That's what the Bible reveals. Reveals repeatedly. And the Bible is our authority. Scripture alone And so, having believed the good news of salvation in Christ, we must live by that gospel. And really, the entire Bible, all 66 books, is the gospel. We must live by it and obey it. Believe it and follow it. When we're asked, by what authority do you do this or that? We must be able to say, on the authority of the Bible, on the authority of the Word of God, we have no solid ground other than that. So that means we are to believe it and we are to submit to it. It can make us uncomfortable. It exposes failings. But by the Spirit's ministry, it gives healing, spiritual and moral strength, spiritual and moral health and wisdom for life. But we must yield to it and follow it. May God give us the grace to do that. To yield our minds to His light and truth and walk faithfully with Him. If you've not believed in Christ, consider the parable of the vineyard and the goodness and the patience of God. He sent His Son to die for sinners and save those who trust in Him. Today is the day of His patience. Someday His patience will run out. There's a day of judgment. There's a day of reckoning. That may sound harsh and unkind. Really, I can say nothing kinder and more loving to you than that. There is a present danger you are in. Flee to the cross. There you'll find salvation and health. Genuine spiritual health. Life. God help you to do that. To come to Him. And you who have, 
Believe in Him. You've been reconciled to the God of the universe and made His child, His son, His daughter. Now live for Him by God's grace. Let's stand and sing in conclusion hymn number 40 in the Songs of Praise book, one of the great hymns of the faith by Charles Wesley, Arise My Soul. So let's arise. What a glorious thing it is that we can come before you, the God of the universe, and cry, Abba, Father. We're sinners and undeserving, but you have changed all of that. You've made sinners your sons and daughters. Praise the God, the God of the universe for doing that. The God of all grace and mercy. We thank you, Father, for what we are in Christ and what you've done for us. May we, with hearts of deep gratitude, live obediently for you as lights in the midst of this world. We pray for the grace to do that, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.